lady comes. All right. Hello and welcome to the Barcast. I'm your host, Nick Barr, joined today um, by independent researcher, space explorer, tool builder, and coder designer, Aslan Elza. Aslan, it's it's wonderful to have you on the Barcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, we're going to do another segment of the immensely popular um, cards, the power of cards, potentially known as the card cast. Um, I, th I think the, the way that I properly became familiar with you was through your tweet not too long ago, um, where, by the way, it's a very lovely photograph. You had like a nice um, shallow depth of field. It was like a very striking photograph, but you were prototype. Like I was as entranced by the photo as the prototype itself, but you've been prototyping some, uh, well, I'll, I'll try to phrase it, but then you, you take it away sort of, um, prototyping social networks and social experiences through the card medium. So it's not just through pen and paper, but really thinking specifically about cards and almost reimagining a lot of social networks as if they were card games. Yeah, and in that picture, I was actually like trying to imagine what Twitter would look like if it was a card game. Like imagining you have a deck in the middle and you can kind of draw cards from the deck to create a feed and write cards and place them on the top of the deck. and from which other people will draw from. The, the whole depth of field and everything in that picture was totally fake. I just blurred it. Like, oh, no. <laughs> uh, my camera is not that special. I just used my phone. <laughs> well, your phone did a great job. I actually, I am a new dad and I bought a, uh, a Fuji, um, you know, a, a, they're not called DSLRs anymore. I think it's a mirrorless camera. It's a nice camera. Yeah. Nice digital camera. And then, I bought a, I think it's a thousand dollar lens that is the first F 1.0 lens or maybe the second F one. So it's super shallow depth of field. And um, I, I don't know how to take photos with it, but I just, I'm constantly putting on 1.0 and be like, wow, look at how shallow that depth of field is. So I, I'm a sucker for that, but I don't have the eye to know when it's synthetic versus the real thing. So nice. Yeah, have you played, have you played the card game with others? Like, so what does it look like when you're preparing this prototype? No, not yet. It was just kind of like this idea I was thinking about and talking to people about mostly. Um, like, what if we could, what if we prototyped social networks through cards? And the idea that, like, this, because I, I sometimes prototype games with my friends or make variations on existing board games. Um, one particular contender is this game called Bananagrams. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, I love Bananagrams. Um, yeah, my friends and I have like 30 different variations and we combine it with like Settlers of Catan to play Settlers of Banan or Catanagrams <laughs> or something. <laughs> There's a lot of names. Um, and so like we often end up doing these mashups and new rules end up really coming out of play, right? Like we test stuff out and we see oh did that work did it not and so it's so much easier to kind of like evolve an idea and if we could prototype with cards digital experiences then you might kind of encounter things that you might not have thought of introducing like well if you have cards what if you like pin two cards together or kind of like um tape them in a long line or like there's a lot of things you can do physically with cards that maybe you wouldn't have been able to do if you had implemented in a digital medium first right um i want to get more into that but before we do i like to ask my guests a question which is what is your earliest childhood memory of cards oof that's interesting um things I had a lot of early memories of cards so I can't really pinpoint the earliest one um my dad used to play Magic the Gathering and so I have quite a lot of like old Magic the Gathering cards mm -hmm. uh, not quite so old as Alpha but uh, had like many big boxes of those and when I was younger I used to try to build decks with them um uh, 
So I, I, I can't pinpoint my early experience, but one experience that really stands out for me is playing magic with my friends in elementary school. Mm. And there was this big round table at the back of the library where we would kind of gather around that and play magic. Uh, yeah. And I also remember from that being inspired to invent my own card game, which I designed all the illustrations and graphics for and like a vector editing program I had on my computer, uh, printed them out on cardstock and like put them in the sleeves. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it was ever playable, but it's fun to look back on. Did you, you, you did the cardstock and everything. So that's, that's quite something. What other games were people sitting around playing in that era was like, were there other games in town? Surely there was Pokemon, um, but I was never part of that. I were can't you, remember. You like I can't remember magic? much about Is, like Pokemon cards or anything, but. Um, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic, like were all these things around, but you were focused on Magic? I, or I do remember some Yu-Gi-Oh cards, but yeah, mo most of the like people I knew were into Magic and I didn't know anyone who was into Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or any of those. Got it. Um, yeah, I mean, you were starting to talk about the ways that we can use cards. And one of the things I was excited to talk to you about was sort of like um, nouns and verbs for, uh, for lack of a better word. I, I, I've seen you've written a little bit about nouns and verbs, and so I'm excited to, to dig into that with you. I'll, I'll just share quickly for myself. Um, I think it's a, I think it's an Apple video, like a Apple had these developer, I guess they still have developer conferences, but th there's one from many years ago when someone is just describing how, how they design and build product. And it's just like very simple and very stark in its simplicity of, I don't know if they call them nouns and verbs. They might've been like nouns and actions and concepts. But it was just like on a whiteboard, you could just have three columns of like, these are all the nouns, these are all the objects, these are all the actions or verbs. I think there were some concepts which sort of were sort of like loose groupings of nouns and verbs. And then just on that whiteboard, they prioritize those, prioritize and group those nouns and verbs and like the interface just sort of shakes out of those groupings. And so I, I ended up just sort of using that as a methodology a lot in product building. But I don't see that many people talk about non, nouns and verbs and like, in industry, like when I'm like, hey, what are the nouns on this? What are the verbs? People are kind of like nonplussed by what I'm talking about. It's interesting because yeah. it's the simplest way of describing the grammar and yet it feels sort of alien to the industry. So those are my initial observations, but tell me tell me more about your interest in, in nouns and verbs. Yeah, I feel like I came up to this idea of nouns and verbs on my own before hearing it in others. And so I kind of had this like internal mental model of, you know, the like actions you're doing in a piece of software being some of the verbs and some of the like, um, well, objects are the nouns. Um, and then I think it might have been like Andy Matushik that I first heard using um, nouns and verbs in this same way. And I was like, oh, wow, it's like, the exact same thing I understand what he's saying <laughs> um and so that's that was kind of interesting I, I think it's like a really nice metaphor I mean most metaphors kind of bring okay I I don't know if I can say most metaphors because I don't know all metaphors off the top of my head but a lot of metaphors are of like physical objects and things right. i think <laughs> um something is like a sun or something that's not a metaphor but <laughs> anyways um but language is kind of interesting metaphor for things that you're kind of like using it to communicate something right it, interface is communicating something therefore it's composed of these nouns and verbs does that make sense <laughs> it, it does I, I there's a lot we can say about metaphor and and i'll i'll get to it in a moment but 
tell me why you, I think your post was written like um, design verbs, not objects. Is that something, is, is that right? Like, um, that rings a bell. Sound, it sounded at some point like you had a stance. Um, I, I have it up, so let me read it to you. Um, when designing any system, think first about the verbs present in that system. Mm. Um, verbs multiply the possibility of interaction. I, I thought that was interesting. So tell me, maybe, maybe you've, you've updated your thinking there, but I, I had never thought about like, I think in my sort of methodology, I just dump a bunch of objects dump, or nouns, dump a bunch of verbs and then sort of figure it out. And it sounded like you had kind of an interesting stance on the power of verbs and sort of a verb first design principle. So I was curious to learn more about that. I think, yeah, that, that stems from trying to think of the kind of like human first design, mm -hmm. essentially. And maybe I hadn't kind of come to that wording just yet. Um, I think I've always been trying to trying to explore and figure out different ways of turning design into a more bottom up process instead of a top down one. And for example, like an urban planner, if you're designing a city, like an urban planner might lay out the roads and the grid of the city and then like continually uh, delve into finer and finer details, like what things might go where, what buildings here, there, zoning, regulations, etc. The architect might design the exterior of a building and then like go iteratively further down into the details of that building, the structure and the rooms and what's in each room and the color of the um, sofa, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas this kind of top-down design process it incorporates a lot of assumptions and it incorporates a lot of assumptions about the lower levels. So like when you design the exterior for something, you're kind of assuming something about the interior. Mm -hmm. And I think some of what this like design verbs, not objects is getting at is it's kind of like, what can you do right. in a system? Like what can, starting with the human of like, what can you actually explore and do um, yeah. rather than like the whole like overarching idea. I, yeah. I find that if you explore from the bottom up in this way of like um, finding little like patterns or grouping together ideas, you can kind of create sometimes a different, bigger picture than you would have come up mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. other way around. Yeah, you're making me, maybe I could propose an alternate. I know what you're saying with bottom up. The thing that resonates with me also is inside out, like, um, mm -hmm. you know, a core interaction. And I think game design works this way a lot. I, I don't think this is necessarily the birth of Mario, but it's sort of a typical game designer handbook example of like, there's the core game loop in Mario of the jump. Yeah. And you can just build a whole game around the jump. And okay, but what if he jumps and the, a mushroom comes out, right? What if he jumps and the brick explodes? What if he jumps on something? What if he jumps under something? Um, and you know, you'll have a game like uh, Super Meat Boy, I think is the name of the game that was profiled in this indie game and that struck me as a game that was like inside out design, like mechanics first. And I, I think one thing that's interesting about those games is like, I mean, I, I tend to agree with the methodology. I think it's like right in a lot of ways. It also like, it, those games have their own feel. Like Super Meat Boy, I, as an example, is like not a game I would play. I'm very interested in it, I have respect for it, but it's, it's so mechanics-y it's so clearly like, you know, what happens if me boy can jump twice or jump off a wall? And then it's, you know, classic game design of add one level of complexity. And so you've sort of built it from inside out. And I think that has its own elegance. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there might be another game. I, game design is so much easier to talk about than product design, but like there might be another game where you're like, uh, let's just pretend Zelda was built this way. I don't know if it was, but like, you know, a boy is really the 
hero of Hyrule and will have to, you know, learn all these skills to save the princess or something like that. And then they're like, okay, how are we going to kind of go outside in? And uh, of course, they're not mutually exclusive, right? I think there's like, it, it's bi-directional. Um, but I, so I guess going back to nouns and verbs, then, you know, you could imagine if you're start if you're going noun first, you have this like potentially beautiful static thing, you know, an idea, a visual, a character. Um, but now what, so what? And if you're starting with a verb, you have, I think the nice thing about verbs is like, as a builder, it's so much easier to swap out the nouns later. Like you can just switch out the game asset and be like, you know what? Link should be a woman and Zelda should and be a guy. You completely re-theme everything, but the right. verbs are kind of like a underlying layer. Yeah. Right. So you reference sort of city planners or architects or builders. I think from that mindset, you really probably do want to think about verbs first. Yeah. Where do adjectives come in all this? <laughs> I was thinking about that. I was thinking about this um, game, uh, Apple Hig video from 2007 or whatever. And like wondering where were the adverbs, you know, like I want, I want this done quickly. I want to receive this sweetly. I want this humanely, you know, uh, it's interesting to think about that, you know, tweet, right? Like I like this tweet vigorously. I unfollowed this person reluctantly. Uh, it's interesting to think about moods associated with that and moods make me think about like juice to use the game design metaphor right like um, is this going to have a modal that says are you sure is this going to have a celebration moment are we trying to get you through it as fast as possible are we trying to have you linger yeah I mean like maybe one example would be like if you imagine liking something on twitter versus like clapping for something on medium Mm -hmm. I feel like two kind of different experiences because with the clap you can just like kind of click on it as many times as you want right um, whereas with the tweet it's just like a toggle right like unlike like unlike and so it yeah. is kind of the same idea essentially this kind of metric of you like something but one is kind of a lot more a lot kind of like I, I don't know if I can describe it as being like vibrant or like it's a lot more energy. You're just like, yeah. Yeah. And also how, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how intermediated sort of is the application layer. So um, I think about this with AI a lot. Uh, I, I had like a lengthy Aladdin analogy that I used a while ago. I can try to brush it off. Have you seen Aladdin? I also have never seen Aladdin. So it's not, it's not a good idea for me to view. But what I knew about Aladdin is I knew that there's a magic carpet and I knew that there's a genie. Hmm. Do you have like an idea of those entities in your, I can give you as much context as you need for Aladdin. I'm happy to. Yeah, I mean, go ahead and explain it. I'll, I'll say if I don't understand anything. So Aladdin is this guy who is out to get the princess and has lots of adventures along the way. And he has lots of helpers. There, there's so many assistants and helpers in, in this movie. And so one of the helpers is Magic Carpet, who is like a regular carpet, but at some point turns to life. And actually uh, Aladdin and um, Jasmine, the princess have this beautiful magic carpet ride in which Jasmine falls in love with Aladdin. So the magic carpet is like animate, but it's like completely out of the way as they're having this magic carpet ride. It's like, it's sort of the most disintermediated uh, assistant. Um, in contrast, Genie is like gregarious. He's voiced by uh, Robin Williams and he like can do anything and he'll do whatever Aladdin asks him to do, but he'll do it with like a lot of pizzazz and like, aren't I great? So in some sense, he's sort of in competition with Aladdin, like Jasmine, like is Jasmine gonna be impressed with Aladdin or is she gonna be impressed with Genie when Aladdin says, hey, give it, give, I want Jasmine to have some flowers and Genie pops them out of his body and hands them to Jasmine. So probably not worth the, the deep dive, but those are examples of, you know, on the one hand, very disintermediated, you barely there application layer, and the other is sort of doing it on your behalf. So when you, when you brought up that medium clapping thing, I thought of it as, or periscope heart tapping, you know, there've been a lot of interfaces that have done that. And they're very, uh, you really feel like you're giving the applause, you're giving the heart. Um, yeah. 
whereas you can imagine other experiences where it's like um, recommend this and you know you sort of if I if I recommend something I kind of feel more that I'm like letting the system know that I would like the system to surface it in different ways it feels much more sort of um, yeah mediated for, for better and worse um, have you read uh, the the Julian Jaynes book, The Breakdown of Consciousness in the Bicameral Mind? No, I've, I've heard a lot about it, um, but I can't say that I've read it myself. I just wanted to touch on it because you mentioned metaphor and language. And of course, like language and metaphor, you can go as deep as you want on, on that. But uh, Jaynes just has this really beautiful framework for describing metaphor in detail. And uh, I, won't, I won't go into it too much now, um, except to, um, if I say like um, the snow blanketed the earth, right? I've, I've, I've deployed a metaphor blanket. Um, and you're kind of understanding snow in terms of blanket. Right, right. And so um, he just describes a lot of like, okay, you've got this, you've got this prime metaphor and it has sort of a, a metafire and a metafied to use his sign language. Like the thing that I know that, I know what a blanket is, right? So yeah. blanket is like really concrete to me and I'm trying to describe snow, which is a little bit more like iffy. Um, but then that projected entity, which is the snow can project back um, what he calls metafrans to parafriers. The language is wild, but it's very evocative because you know you can then say like, you know, the snow blanketed the earth and, um, you know, the earth was warmed by that and, you know, fell into a sweet slumber. Um, uh, you can say that, um, kind of lost the, sweet, the sweetness of this poetry here, but like, uh, what else can we say about blankets and earth? Um, well, you know, hibernation, right? So now I'm getting hibernation metaphors. Uh, you know, the animals too could sleep under that blanket. And when they would awake in the alarm bells of springtime, it's like a very fertile metaphor. And he just gives language for that fertility of like sort of this projection, projecting back and forth of, he uses very strange language, but uh, I, I, I find it, I find it resonant, yeah. I, I sometimes think of that, like when you kind of start to extend the metaphor, sometimes into other metaphors, as this kind of like metaphorical coherence and that they all kind of agree with each other. Right. I've actually been reading, um, I don't know if you've heard of this book, but it's called Metaphors We Live By. Mm -hmm. And it goes quite in depth into the topic of metaphors. Um, that's, um, that, that's George, what's the, what's Lakoff. The, can you say it again? George Lakoff. Lakoff, that's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, one example that it keeps coming back to over and over is this example of argument as war. Mm. And so we talk about like shooting down someone's position or kind of like mm -hmm. holding your ground, kind of like these different um, metaphors around war applied to conversation, which creates this kind of argument. Um, and he talks about metaphor being actually very fundamental to how we think mm -hmm. and essentially being like the kind of foundation for thought, uh, which I find quite fascinating. And as a designer, it's quite clearly obvious that metaphors affect design. Um, for example, like the desktop metaphor we have in computing, like our computers, our world of technology would have looked a lot different without this desktop metaphor right. having folders and files and yeah many many people are now lamenting that uh constraint and i think we haven't yet found a new metaphor to latch onto. i think uh so it, i i think i think lakoff is right it, it seems hard to dispute that like language is metaphor, like language is like a city of metaphor, 
That seems probably true. You know, even, and this is the focus of Jane's with consciousness is like, I can see your point. You know, basically the linking of seeing to understanding is for him the foundation of consciousness, which is not a, it's a software update. So for Jane's point will be like, that's about 10,000 years old. Like, it's not like we evolved to do it. It's like the hardware was there. And then at some point we, the conditions were such that we started sort of projecting onto this empty space in our heads, um, all these metaphors for, for sight. And, you know, you can go really deep on the etymology that, that sort of backs that up. But um, when you're, when you're talking about um, um, <clears throat> oh, I completely lost the what were you just war war yeah yeah um, that that totally resonates and and oh and desktops right talking yeah. about at, at war with desktops I wonder like do you think here's a question for you. Like, do you think we're reaching uh, in technology an interesting stage where like we lack metaphors for a lot of the critical new innovations? So, I mean, I'll just use blockchain as an example or let's just stick with blockchain. Do you think blockchain is merely like complex to understand and hard to implement for technologists? Or is it also like somehow alien and like lacking metaphors that we can, we being like the folk, um, grab onto. And if, if you don't feel equipped to answer that, feel free to like skip the question. I mean, we can use it. I haven't, I haven't actually thought much about blockchain itself. Um, I mean, there's the obvious kind of like chain metaphor, which I guess is the ledger right. blockchain, where you're kind of like adding these blocks of calculation i mean well, not. even i mean even even networked thought or whatever you want to call this figma rome whatever world like yeah that that also seems to like lack metaphor like like we have this new mode that we could be creating in but then what is that like what is that mode like that i can be familiar with i guess that's what james would call the metified like what it, what am I what am I bringing it back that makes me feel secure? Does it lack metaphor or is the metaphor getting kind of more abstract? Like a network isn't something that I can know and feel. Like I I understand a desktop, right? Like yeah, maybe I have a desk. I work on that desk. Network is like a much more vague and like abstract idea than a desk that's a physical object. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a chain is physical, but we don't really use chains in that way. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it, it does seem that we're, we're encountering like an age of kind of alien to me, and I, I'm, I'm asking you the question because I also, I'm open to being just like uh, old or like not, not smart enough, but like when I think about these new technologies, like, um, I mean, like all the natural language processing stuff that's going on, GPT-3 or whatever, and oh, it has hundreds of knobs. So I'm like, okay, cool. Like my metaphor is that it's like, I'm a DJ and I'm creating music with all these knobs. Mm. That, that sounds interesting but then i have all these all these things that i want to do with uh, that metaphor and they're like no 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 these knobs no one knows what these knobs mean and they change like all the time so like get that get that out of your head like um of course you can do some interesting stuff and robin sloan i think most interestingly started to like really map the space like give me this sentence and give me that sentence and then give me the sentence exactly in the middle of those like that's a very interesting you know, he's using the spatial metaphor as well, but yep. the results never make sense because the, the, the prompt itself is almost like not well-founded. Like there, there is no middle of these two sentences. It's like in an alien consciousness, that's, that's how the alien thinks about it. Yeah, I remember early on with GPT-3, just like getting it to say the opposite sentence 
like what is the exact opposite in meaning to this oh that's interesting yeah and some, sometimes it have quite hilarious results and can you have it argue with itself and like oppose that opposite <laughs> I, I did actually like write a uh negative essay where i like took an essay i had wrote written got it to like rewrite it in the opposite <laughs> and then read through that and it was like kind of interesting especially when you kind of like explore the complete opposite of an idea like right if you explore the kind of extreme boundary of what you don't want <laughs> yeah it tells you a lot about what you want yeah yeah i think that's a very like worthy um exercise yeah you don't we don't do it enough in in industry but usually you have a much clearer sense of what you don't want and it's very alive like you it's like also a, easier to both talk about and to agree on what mm -hmm. you don't like but it's harder to talk about and agree on what you want and what you like sometimes that's like a much more vague and nebulous concept right right and i was reading i was reading actually this book on like communities and this kind of these creative communities throughout history um groups of writers groups of artists etc and they often form first around this like collective dislike of something like just like kind of attacking against certain ideas certain people just like pushing away from that and eventually they reach a stage where they start to open up to each other and um, explore their own kind of style and um, art in a way but it, it starts with saying like oh I don't like this I don't like that and they need to kind of go through that stage to get to the stage of exploring their own stuff and what they do like. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting. I mean, as soon as you said it, you made me think about artists because like artists are infamous for sort of like loathing other artists and like distancing themselves from schools that an outsider would be like, I don't see the difference between, you know, neo express expressionism and post neo-expressionism or like whatever i'm making those up but I'm, they probably exist in some thing and so but i don't think i don't think i've ever had a thesis of like why that like loathing is there and i think i think it, you're onto something about coale coalescing and also developing a view developing an aesthetic and sort of saying like okay well i'm not that i'm the opposite of that and this is okay okay that, i guess that's what i am um, I do want to briefly tie this back to cards because I think, I think you and I had a brief exchange that I want to dig into more, which is sort of cards seem to have this superpower. And I think you posed the idea that it also might be a, if not a super weakness, maybe a super threat, are cards superheroes or super villains? And so cards are very fertile for metaphor um, or maybe not metaphor, but they're just it's a noun with a lot of verbs. Actually, that's interesting. If we tie it back to what you're talking about before about verb first, cards are maybe one of the few nouns that just automatically un unbundle like a shit ton of verbs, right? So yeah. Um, and well, the other kind of metaphor I brought up in that conversation was paper, right? Mm -hmm. This like metaphor of paper that it, it's prevalent in a lot of our technology like we open document and we see this page like the page doesn't have to be separated from the other pages right in google docs or microsoft word but it is because we're kind of like using and understanding this metaphor um but we can't manipulate that page in like any of the ways that we can manipulate a physical piece of paper right, right. like I have a piece of paper right here and like I can fold it. I can like turn it into a paper airplane. I can throw it, crumple it up. Um, I can do all sorts of things. I can cut it into various shapes. I can like fold it. And then if I cut it at the fold, then it's going to create some kind of like um, symmetries in mm -hmm. inside that hole. 
So there's like so many different things you can do with a piece of paper. Um, and in a sense, cards are kind of like a subset of paper, but also creating their own interesting set of constraints. And um, they kind of evolve their own set of verbs through how they're used. Cards, cards seem in a way less infuriating in the digital medium than paper. Like the things you, even though software rarely does all the things that cards want to do, it, it certainly can in, in, in online games it does where like, I want to shuffle, I want to deal, I want to fold, I want to trade, I want to draft, I want to flip, I want to turn sideways. Um, paper, like you were just doing paper, paper has so many, paper's disposability is maybe one of its most endearing qualities, right? Like I can crumple and uh, I can chuck into the wastebasket. And software, of course, you can imagine a software where like, yeah, go for it. You're like, you can imagine us building software where you do that and it would have nothing of the satisfaction that that physical action just did. Whereas cards, even in real life, like your cards, you were putting them in sleeves, right? They're, card, you don't, you don't mess with cards. Like you actually protect cards and you make sure they don't get scuffed. And so I wonder if that lends to the digital translation being smoother because at the end of the day, you're gonna put them neatly kind of back into storage. That's, that's what we do physically with cards and software is happy to do that too. Yeah, and I think there's something there and like the crumpling of the paper, there's this kind of like paper feel, right? Mm -hmm. that, that feel you get interacting with paper. And I think sometimes when we want to like bring metaphors into the digital space, I think like going for almost less of a literal interpretation and more of like trying to get that similar feeling mm -hmm. of like, I mean, how, for example, could you make something feel like you kind of like crumple something up and throw it away? Right like that, that feeling of doing that action. I, I don't know if you can replicate it. And then with cards, like how do you, how do you create a card feel? Um, I guess one thing I wonder about is like, so we agree that cards are this super noun and we can define a super noun as something that has like at least 10 verbs attached to it that are nearly universally known, right? Let's, let's just work with that definition. And are maybe different enough from each other. Yeah. Are there other super nouns? Is, is cards the only super noun? I, I want to inspect like what, what makes a super noun a super noun? Like what happened to make that possible? Um, hmm. I was just thinking like, we often use transportation metaphors. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking out loud, like, a car i mean mo most of what you do the car skateboard or bike is like that action of going from one place to another but yeah. i mean on a skateboard you can do tricks on a bike you can do tricks um uh, like wheelies and different kinds of like i i don't even know all the verbs <laughs> <for those things. laughs> well i mean i was thinking maybe a letter might be a super noun so a letter you can write a letter you can fold a letter, you can send a letter, you can receive a letter, you can archive a letter, you can stamp a letter. Um, I just, I'm wondering a little bit, I guess implicit in my wondering here is like, are super nouns just super nouns kind of arbitrarily because, hey, you're, use, you're doing something that people have been doing for a long time, right? Like writing letters and people are playing cards and dominoes and stuff like, you know, thousands of years BC. So you've got a lot of human history or is there actually something almost like aesthetically there too that like um, uh, the way that, I don't know, the way cards are thin, cards are samey, um, that, that is also relevant. There's something about like, you know, the verbs, are interactions with the object, right? Like you're physically manipulating the cards in different ways, whether that's like trading them, folding them, tip, tapping them, or like rotating them. <laughs> um, 
drawing from a deck, shuffling, yeah. sorting, etc. That like these are all manipulations of a card. Um, I was thinking like plants have a lot of verbs attached to them. Like you can water, you can trim, you can right. um, dig, you can weed, you can um, do all these different lies to a plant. But how well would a plant work as a metaphor for something else? I don't know if just having, I mean, I think a plant could be an interesting metaphor, but I don't know if having a bunch of verbs associated with something is necessarily going to lead to something that's always better. I think, I think plants are deeply interesting super nouns in part because they sort of defy the exercise that we're going through. Like, even though there are many verbs that can be associated with them, I think in my experience, plants come into use the most when they're actually counterbalancing my sort of systems -y mental models of how things work. So if I, if I'm going to therapy and I'm like, doc, it's been five weeks, I'm, I'm not seeing the rate of, I'm not seeing progress, you know, what's our next milestone? right? Like I've been doing this for a while and like, I expect it to be at a level five now. The therapist might sort of be like, Hey, this is more like watering a plant, right? Like you're growing seasons change, you know, sometimes you're not going to see the growth. Like, like it's sort of this balm counterbalance to sort of the very agentic noun verb thing. And yet they do have a lot of verbs associated with them. I haven't, I'm thinking about like software that feels plant-like, you know, I, certainly I think those Tamagotchi, like the, the, any kind of pet simulator, any kind of Farmville thing where you're like, you're checking in a lot, you know, and it's, Hey, things have changed since I last was here. Um, but. Uh, Something that kind of grows on its own while you're away. Yeah. And is somewhat unpredictably responsive to the things you do like it registers yep. okay the soil is wet now but like other than that it, there's no response to my watering um hmm. yeah can you think of like software that's like a plant because all i can think of is software is that deploy the plant analogy toward harm right like zynga or whatever that like actually literally put you on a farm and then sort of like exploit your watering thing whereas uh, uh there was a game did you see the game called mountain it was like very like lo-fi and you just sort of like checked yeah, in and mountain was there that's the only example i can think of i almost feel like we're often like more often than not we're the plant right. because we're the one that grows that's interesting mm -hmm. and we, we also have some like metaphors in our language that kind of um, hints towards this like we are the plant metaphor of like if you move to a new place you will have to like set down new roots there mm. right? and um, there's a few more metaphors I was thinking about this recently in well you know ever since he planted roots in Vancouver he's really been blossoming you know he's yeah really, exactly he's really grown up he's He's bearing the fruits of all of his hard work, you know, I think. And if you think about the, like, what metaphors that kind of coheres with, mm -hmm. uh, it kind of leads to this, like, city as soil, right? Mm -hmm. Because we grow in the soil of a city, kind of, like, blossom and grow upon that and, like, through the nutrients of a place. And I also sort of equate cities and uh, kind of like internet digital spaces as well so looking at software as almost more the soil mm. from which like if something is a tool that helps you do something you want maybe that tool to help you be able to grow mm -hmm. better person in some way um to be able to kind of like grow towards whatever goals you might have to uh, i think we just i think we just came up with your twitter your new linkedin profile or whatever 
I'm gonna, I have to Google what is, what is a soil scientist? You know, like, cause the, the, the you know, if I don't follow wine that carefully, but wine is like, you know, complete revolution because of organic wine and the soil that, um, the nutrients there, that's like kind of the frontier of, so you're gonna, you're gonna be a, a soil scientist. So it's, it auto-completed soil sa scientist salary. Soil scientist salary, soil scientist salary, soil scientist That's the tongue twister. Scientist salary, soil scientist salary. It's interesting, I guess. I don't think there's a fancy name for it. it sounds like it's just a soil scientist. Soilologist, I don't know. <laughs> right, I was kind of trying to get like Latin with it or Greek with it, but I couldn't do it. All right, that's not a, that's not a rabbit hole. I'm gonna go down now. Um, as we, as we wrap, um, I saw that you, you were a pioneer alum. And of course I'm doing work that's a little bit younger, a little bit different, but, um, in the same spirit, um, I'm really curious to hear what metaphors you experienced with, with pioneer cards or otherwise. I mean, I, I find competitions like incredibly fascinating and that like I, I've participated in so many different kinds of competitions throughout my life. Um, particularly one that keeps coming up is game jams. Mm -hmm. So like since I was 12, I was participating in this um, this competition called Ludum Dare mm -hmm. in which people make a game and all art and assets and code in 48 hours. And it's time box in, well, yeah, it's time box into 48 hours. And that kind of helps create this like intense space and also creates this almost like learning space in which like I learn a lot more from participating in that, in that like 48 hours. And it pushes me in a lot of new directions of like, I maybe never thought of making music for my games before or art, <laughs> right? And like, so that like pushes me to explore like making some pixel art or like figuring out how to like arrange a little tune for. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's something that I want to kind of like delve further into like how, how these kind of challenges almost structure how we learn. Right. Uh, I'm incredibly passionate about like thinking about the future of learning and tying this back to cards. I was actually thinking the other day of like, what if you like, okay, sometimes I write down on a card, some kind of like challenge to myself or some kind of provocative question, or I might give myself a challenge to like write a bunch of bad ideas in like, five minutes around a particular topic to kind of lower my barrier, just like get stuff on a page. Um, and sometimes I kind of formulate these challenges into things that I do over and over again. Sometimes they're more one-off uh, ideas, but I find this kind of mode of like little fast challenges really fascinating and I would love sometimes to share them with others. Mm -hmm. Like if I take a challenge I've just done, I want to be able to ask like a bunch of my friends who might be interested in the same thing of like, oh, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this question, this right. idea. And then that would naturally lead to some kind of evolution some kind of like evolving of the ideas in question mm -hmm. uh -huh. and it kind of it fits well with this card metaphor in that you can write little questions or prompts on cards and you can kind of pass them around trade them collect them uh, you can like create a deck of questions and flip through these to kind of think through each one right yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, 
and it's close to home. So on Hello World, challenges are the primary noun on the app, you know, um, rather than filling out application forms, members participate in challenges that are highly scaffolded to elicit the things that the challenge makers care about. Is a um, challenge a noun or a verb? It's almost both. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and it's also, it, 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 it's what a challenge really is, is, is a call and response, right? And so embedded in that noun is a, uh, it sort of has a hook. It's, it's, it's a noun with a verb kind of trace hanging, right? So when you start a challenge, it sort of has its, um, its own quality. And I, th I think that conformity is something that's really interesting. So everything is public as I'm sure it was with Pioneer where like you're seeing other people's work. There's not the secrecy. You're, you're in the deck um, of cards and that both lends a sense of inspiration, like belonging, but then it also pulls a little bit of like, okay, how do I separate? And I think that's one thing that I noticed with challenge apps in general that I really appreciate. I mean, if you want to stretch Instagram as an example, when Instagram started, all you could do is capture and it had to be a square and you could choose one of the, it was a challenge, right? It was like, what's the best thing you can do with this highly constrained medium? And you went through this process in early Instagram days of a lot of creativity, but then things started to feel the same. And so people sort of fold back and then tinker with and undermine and challenge the challenge itself. Uh, so I'm a big fan of that metaphor and I'm also a big fan of, I don't, I don't think I've cracked it yet, but for some people, they love competition and they just get it. Game jams, I would imagine are perfect for that because game jams are already pretty light. But then when you're talking about something as high stakes as a scholarship, it doesn't feel that like fun. You know, it feels like, okay, there's a scarce number of seats and I need to kind of compete for it. And yeah, game jam is more of like a friendly competition where like, right everyone who participates wants everyone else to participate right and particularly litum dare because there's no prizes or anything right. it's like everyone who's participating is participating because they want to make games and one thing i find fascinating about that is people will um at the end everyone rates each other on hmm. different categories like how fun kind of like sound the art um various different categories about the game and you get a ranking at the end uh, like i was 268th in fun <laughs> and i was like maybe 11th in audio maybe yeah. I, I like spent a lot of time on the sound um and what's interesting is that even if someone doesn't get like an objectively good score necessarily like maybe they're like in the two or three hundreds for all these different categories out of maybe like a thousand participants like people will compare themselves against their past self is something mm -hmm. i found mm -hmm. is like no matter what people got they'll often be like yes this was a success because i did better than last time right and so it's like a lot less about comparing yourself to others and more about comparing yourself to yourself. And I think the more you can make things about comparing yourself to yourself versus comparing yourself to others, um, the better. Yeah, well said. Um, Aslan, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, for sure. I feel like we've only started a long rabbit hole. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, there's a lot more to talk about um, either on a future episode of Cards or elsewhere. I look forward to uh, following your work and, and keeping the conversation going.